bow our heads. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this glorious day, a day that you have made, and we want to rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Father, we thank you this day that you have brought together people of the kingdom so that, Father, we can stand for the greatest gift of grace that you bestowed upon humanity, which was freedom and liberty. Father, we thank you for that gift, and we want to stand up for our rights, Father. No more do we want to be servants to the archangel. We want to stand and inherit the true inheritance that you have for us, the children of God, the citizens of this world. We thank you that you have brought Dan Johnson here today, who is a patriot and a young man who is changing the world from the local level all the way to the national level now. We're so excited. And Father, we pray that you would anoint him and give him strength and that his works will find success and flourish throughout this land and to the world. Father, we thank you so much. Once again, anoint him as he speaks and educates us on this issue today. And Father, be with each and every one of us here so that we may be strengthened, we may be emboldened, we may come to live life. And Father, that we will stand against evil and stand for righteousness and goodness so that your people can truly be free. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord and all those who have gathered here today. Amen and I do. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Okay. Okay. Glad to have with us today Dan Johnson. This must be old, this is 20 years old. I can him about 15, 16, can you? <laughs> 21. Founder of People Against the NDAA, Panda. Nationally renowned writer and speaker. Founded the Panda in January 2012. Grew it to the largest anti-NDAA organization in America. Pushing now over 18 pieces of state and numerous pieces of local anti-NDAA legislation. Then decentralized and created the NDAA resistance. I like the word resistance, don't you? Yes. Now a movement thousands strong since early 2012, six cities in one county have banned the NDAA and the laws of war with nearly 100 in progress. Somebody say amen. amen. Dan has written for several publications, including the Huffington Road Policy, whatever this is, Occupy.com. And Western journalism, he has spoken at Paul Fest and Northwest Ohio Conservation Conferences, March Against Monsanto Liberatoria, whatever that is. <laughs> the Constitutional, somebody give me really fine writing here, it's going to be good to do, okay? And more and more has been interviewed on numerous radio and television shows, including Coast to Coast AM Liberty Rounds Table. Red Eyes Radio, RT America, and now the greatest movement that he's ever been in, Sanctuary Church. And this is going to make you powerful. It's going to make you. I'll tell you what, I've never seen so much information, so much power in one young man in all my life. we got some leaders God is raising up around here. They come and take your liberty, show us what we do, give us what path to go on. Let's give a round of applause again. How you guys all doing today? Yeah. That was pathetic. <laughs> How you guys all doing today? Yeah. Hey, much better. All right, that's excellent. Now they gave me an audio plug for the uh, audio here. I'm, as you mentioned, my name is Dan Johnson, the founder and national director of Panda People Against the NDAA. We are a grassroots, nonpartisan movement. We don't care if you're left, right, upside down, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, does not matter. Our rights are more important than party lines. And so we started Panda, I started Panda back in January 2012. I came across a video called 63 Senators Betrayed You Today. Now, I never wanted to get involved in politics. I was gonna go into business. I had run my own little lawn care business and I'd run a couple online businesses. I was going to go into business because I wanted to help people, and I figured that was one of the best ways to help people. 
Well, I started really looking into politics and started really understanding that as much as I didn't like it, it determines everything. It determines who you can be. It determines who you can associate with, how much money you can make, how much money of that you can keep. It determines every aspect of your life. And when I realized that, even though I consider politics after two and a half years in this, considered it and still consider Polly being many and ticks being blood-sucking creatures. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 Although that is my general view of politics, it is something that I decided to get into. And uh, I went to college, uh, studied political science at Bowling Green State University. And when I was studying political science there, came across this video, 63 Senators Betrayed You Today. And I'm sitting in front of that video. I didn't want to get involved in the actual politics of it until after I completed my degree. I wanted to go to four years and then go into politics and maybe city council, county commissioner, state representative, all non Congress, etc. And uh, I came across this video describing the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act. And I remember I grew up studying the rise and fall of the Third Reich in Germany. I grew up studying the rise and fall of Imperial Japan. I grew up studying when 120,000 Japanese Americans were detained without trial here in this country. And I remember thinking, they're doing it again. History is repeating itself again. And uh, my parents brought me up with a mentality of put up or shut up. So you either do something about it or you be quiet and sit back down. And did some more research, it was around finals time, I was actually procrastinating homework, that's how I found out about it. And uh, it was around finals time, so I did some more research, about after about a month and a half, I actually founded the organization with a couple other college students. Our first action went down to Bowling Green City Council in Bowling Green, Ohio, so northwest Ohio near Toledo. Went to Bowling Green City Council with a simple request. Of course, the NDAA and military detention will never happen in this city. Just sign something saying it won't. That's all we're asking. Put your name in a piece of paper saying the military will not pick up someone without a charge, without a trial, and throw them in jail forever. They, it won't happen here in this city. Just, just sign your name and say it won't. And the response we got was in an email from the mayor to the chair of city council. They said, and I quote, these students should have taken government 160. They don't know the inner workings of our national government, and it's up to us, in some respects, to educate them. They told us to go back to basic government class. Now, there are times when two roads diverge into wood, as Robert Frost talks about. Two roads diverge into a wood, and I took the road less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. We decided to prove him wrong. We decided to launch Panda Nationwide. To date, we have introduced 18 pieces of state-level legislation. We reach anywhere from 500,000 to a million people per month. And we are the largest movement in the nation combating federal tyranny at a local level. So I have a short video to play for you here. Uh, this goes through some of the basics of the NDAA and gives you a little bit of an idea of what I'll be talking about the rest of the day. Oh, the lights. Anybody has the light, light switch anywhere? Earlier this week, the president signed the National Defense Authorization Act. A radical new claim of presidential power. It gives the military the power to indefinitely detain American citizens, <clears throat> suspected, not convicted some sort of involvement or affiliation with terrorism. A bill that allows U.S. citizens to be transported overseas to prisons and held there without charges filed. Senators John McCain and Carl Levin are looking to make America into a military state and give the president the power to be judge, jury, and executioner. When President Obama signed the NDAA, sections of the bill were opposed by key members of his administration. Many civil liberties activists believe the law is unconstitutional. is it takes a wrecking ball to the United States Constitution. It explicitly says that he has the authority to target American citizens because he believes they're bad people. The government is claiming the power under the Afghanistan authorization for use of military force as a justification for entering American homes to grab people, indefinitely detain them, and not give them a charge in a trial individual, no matter who they are, if they pose a threat to the security of the United States of America, should not be allowed to continue that threat. And when they say, I want my lawyer, you tell them, shut up. You're trying to get a lawyer. 
You're an enemy for that. There may be a number of people who cannot be prosecuted for past crimes. In some cases because evidence may be tainted. But who nonetheless pose a threat to the security of the United States. There is one thing and one thing only that is protecting American citizens, and that's our Constitution. Is a baseball stadium more important than liberty? Are liquor licenses more important than due process? Please know what will come your way. Death, detention, prosecution. It is time to stand, to peacefully bring about a revolution. One day, somebody's going to have to say, enough. Indeed, one day, someone is going to have to say, enough. So we'll cover a few things today about the National Defense Authorization Act. We're going to cover what is it, how is it bad, does the NDA undermine your constitutional rights, and finally, what can and should you do about it? So, what is the NDAA? The NDAA stands for the National Defense Authorization Act. It's been passed every year for about 53 years by Congress and generally just funds the military. That's great. However, it became the perfect haystack to th start throwing needles into. In 2008, 2000, or 2007, 2008 NDAA, <clears throat> there was a section in there that authorized the Council of Governors. This Council of Governors is one governor from each of the federal emergency management regions of the country. So we have 10 regions, there's 10 governors on this council. Their job is to deal with national security emergencies. So how are we going to combat tornadoes, floods, uh, uh, terrorist attacks, etc.? Well, one of the things in their mission outlined in executive order later in the year, one of the things outlined in their mission is to figure out how to use the military on U.S. soil and on U.S. citizens. Then, in 2012, that NDAA, they figured out how to do it. In the 566-page law are sections 1021 and 1022. In a nutshell, they authorize the indefinite military detention of any person, including an American citizen, without charge or trial, and the application of the laws of war to United States soil, making America a battlefield. It passed 283 to 136 in the House and 93 to 7 in the Senate. Now, supposedly, these people can't even agree what color ink to write their letters with, and yet they agreed on a law that violates 14 provisions of the United States Constitution, 93 to 7. The 2013 NDAA, the vote in the Senate was 98 to 0. This is what your senators think of your rights. In order to understand the NDAA, it takes a little bit of history. Let's go back to the 2001 Authorization for Use of Military Force. Who's heard of the term the War on Terror? Anyone? Okay, so this is America's official entry into the War on Terror. It passed six days after 9-11 on September 17, 2001. Here's the language from the AUMF. In general, the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided in terrorist attacks that occurred on 9-11 or harbored such organizations or persons or to stop future acts of international terrorism on U.S. soil. This is dangerous enough because what person is the only person authorized to use military force against anyone he determines is a threat? The president. One man, not a judge, not a jury, the president. This is already so vague that it was actually used as a justification to go to war in Iraq. This was also used to detain over a thousand American Muslims around the Drake Towers during just after 9-11. All a thousand of them were eventually released. None of them had anything to do with it, but they were all detained by the military under the AUMF. However, the AUMF still ties your detention to a specific event, 9-11, and it ties to a specific group of people, non-citizens. The 2012 NDAA expands that authority. Section 1021b2. A person who is a part of or substantially supported Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces that are engaged in hostilities against the United States or its coalition partners, including any person who's committed a belligerent act 
or directly supported such hostilities in aid of such enemy forces. Now, here's the difference. The AUMF and NDAA 1021B1. Now, this is an interesting lesson for every piece of legislation, every law, not just the NDAA. This 1021B1 was copied and pasted from the AUMF. Now, they didn't have to do that. They only had to cite it. They only had to say, this language came from the AUMF, but they copied and pasted it. Why? Their number one argument against us when we're fighting the NDAA is it did nothing new. So they only point to the portion they copied from the AUMF. They don't point to the next section. Both of those sections say, any person who planned, authorized, committed, aided, or harbored the terrorists perpetrated 9-11, 1021B2, any person who is a part of or supported Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or associated forces engaged in hostilities against coalition partners, including any person who commits a belligerent act or directly supports such hostilities. So note the difference here. Planned, authorized, committed, supported, associated forces, coalition partners, direct support. This goes from, we're arresting someone on account of possible murder, to we're arresting their entire neighborhood, including their chef, including their family, including anyone they know on suspicion of accounted murder. It goes from, we suspect you of committing a criminal act in the future, and we're going to arrest you, to we suspect you of committing a criminal act in the future, and we're going to arrest anyone you know. That is the difference between those two sections. Now, it changes the current national security policy. The NDAA is only supposed to fund our national security policy. The NDAA is only supposed to fund the military. It's only supposed to provide money to fund our current policy, not change it. However, the 2012 NDAA changes current national security policy in that it expands the targeting profile beyond the authorization for use of military force. So now we're no longer targeting non-citizens. Now we're targeting American citizens. We're not just targeting the United States, it's adding countries being protected. We're adding coalition partners. So who knows we've been coalition partners with Iran before? Anyone? Coalition partners with Iran, United States? Okay, several of you, including you, several of you. So we've been coalition partners with Iran before, which means you supported Iran then when they're our ally, and support Iran now when they're our enemy, even though you are still supporting the same country because they are no longer our coalition partner, now you could be considered a threat. Now you could be considered an enemy. Coalition partners change. It changed the time frame. This is the most dangerous part of the 2012 NDAA. Involvement in the criminal attacks of 9-11 is no longer necessary. Now, our justice system is supposed to work this way. You possibly commit the crime. We bring you into court. We prove you commit the crime, and then you go to jail. But here there's no crime being committed. The NDAA does not cite any crime. None. There's no crime, there's no statute, there's no punishment. It's pre-crime. Now who's seen the movie Minority Report? Oh, right, I like, the, I like the hands. Minority Report is a movie with Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise plays a police officer and serves his government. Very, very good movie. And what Tom Cruise is, is he's a police officer in the pre-crime division. So his job is to arrest them before they commit the crime. Who's heard the term, we have to stop the terrorists before they strike? Anybody? Okay, so this is, this is in American dialogue. We have to stop the terrorists before they strike. Well, in Minority Report, he stops criminals before they strike. And what he does, is he has a bunch of video screens, and he says, okay, well, you're about to commit a burglary, arrest you. You're about to commit a murder, arrest you. You're about to commit another crime, arrest you. And what he found out when he's arrested for a crime he was not about to commit is that none of those people he was arresting were about to commit a crime. All of them were enemies of the local government. That's the danger of pre-crime. I point at you, you go to jail, you never committed a crime. That is the war on terror. Now let's examine the war on terror a little more closely. First of all, terrorism. Terrorism is a method and terror is an emotional reaction. You can't legislate either out of existence. So let's, say, let's take a method. If Congress says one day, you're passing a law, you may no longer walk through doors forward. You must now walk through all doors sideways. Who would follow that? It's more efficient. You can put two people through the exact same door you can fit one, and you're not going to follow it. Really? 
You cannot legislate a method out of existence. What about an emotional reaction? What if Congress says we're declaring a war on sadness? America, we are entering the happy days. I can already see mainstream media supporting this, the war on sadness, congressional war on everyone feeling sad. But if they pass a law against sadness, will it stop you from being sad? No. So when they pass a law against terror, why do you support them? It's not going to stop you from being afraid. So what are some of the chances of being killed in a terrorist attack? Here's the risk of terrorism. Anyone want to guess how many Americans, this, this study is from 2011, this latest uh, study they did. Anyone want to guess how many Americans in around the world, not just the United States, around the world, how many Americans were killed in terrorist attacks in 2011? Anyone want to guess? Go ahead. Ten? What else? Three. Three? Anybody else? Eleven. Eleven. Which means you're 17,600 times more likely to die from heart disease than a terrorist attack. You're 12,000 times more likely to die from cancer than a terrorist attack. You're 1,000 times more likely to die from a car accident. 90 times more likely to drown. 12 times more likely to accidentally suffocate yourself in your sleep than die in a terrorist attack. You are nine times more likely to choke to death on your own vomit than die in a terrorist attack. <laughs> you are eight times more likely to be killed by a police officer as an innocent in the line of duty as someone they were not pursuing as a terrorist. So why all this focus on terrorism? The media throws terrorism out all the time. Anyone remember the missing Malaysian plane that we still haven't found? Okay, the missing Malaysian plane? Instantly. Nobody knew anything about it besides it was missing. The media screams, terrorism! They probably flew it to Iran, and Iran's going to attack us with the plane. Okay, they scream terrorism all the time. You'd steal cucumber from the grocery store, they'll scream terrorism. Okay? Why all this focus on terrorism? Why do you hear it all the time, everywhere? Everything somebody does, it's considered terrorism. Why? What's the one word tyrannical dictatorships have used throughout history to control their people? Fear. Fear. So what are they saying when they call someone a terrorist? You are terrorizing people. Terror is extreme fear. So when a politician tells you that I'm passing laws to protect you from terrorism, what they're saying is I'm ruling you by fear. Now, in... The 21st of January, 2012, seven journalists and activists um, sued the Obama administration over the NDAA. And they bring this court, this case to the Southern District Court of New York, Judge Catherine Forrest. So she starts listening to the government's arguments, and she starts listening to the plaintiff's arguments. And she asks the government, okay, so define a belligerent act for me. What's a belligerent act? And the government goes, we don't know. You don't know. You wrote the law. You don't know. You don't know. Okay, all right. So um, if these plaintiffs, or if, if anyone for that matter, wrote a book, let me give you an example. They wrote a book, and in the front page of the book it says, I support the political goals of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And the rest of the book is blank. Could that person be detained into the NDAA? Yeah. We don't know. Well, could any of these plaintiffs who just said they could be detained under the NDAA and brought suit saying that, could they be detained? Well, we don't know. We'll have to check with the laws of war. We'll go check with the laws of war, come back. They come back, we can't tell you. This is what the transcript sounds of the entire court case. The government is asked the question, can you define this? They say we have no idea, over and over and over again. So Judge Catherine Forrest releases this statement. The government was unable to define precisely what direct or substantial support means. Thus, an individual could run the risk of substantially or directly supporting an associated force without even being aware that he or she was doing so. This measure has a chilling impact on First Amendment rights. That's a federal judge, Catherine Forrest. Yeah. Now, within 24 hours, the Obama administration appealed. Within a week, they applied for an emergency stay. Now, what an emergency stay mean? Has anybody ever dealt with a court before in this room? Anybody? Okay. An emergency stay means we're using the law right now. Please give it back to us. That means they're using this law right now. The Second Circuit gave them their emergency stay. Then the plaintiffs appealed. They went to the Second Circuit. They said, this is wrong. You can't do this to us. The Second Circuit said, we're not going to say it's constitutional. 
And we're not going to say it's not constitutional. You just can't challenge it. Because you haven't been indefinitely detained without a trial yet. Well, if you haven't been indefinitely detained without a trial yet, you can go to court. But if you've been indefinitely detained without a trial, how do you get a trial? They catch 22 and they said you don't have standing. So they went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court goes, eh. They didn't say it's constitutional. They didn't say it's unconstitutional. They just went, we're not dealing with that. 9-0, the justices said, nope, we don't want to do it. So the courts have been exhausted. <clears throat> So, recap. The 2012 NDAA does not define terms. It is very vague. Belligerent Act, Associated Forces, Substantially Supported Coalition Partners are not defined in the NDAA. And it authorizes the military to detain any person, including American citizens, until the end of hostilities. When will a war on an idea end? Never. Never. So when will the war on terror end? Never. Never. So you're detained until never. So sometimes Congress does write vague laws. Sometimes like environmental regulations, for example, they say regulate the air. <laughs> and then the EPA figures out how to regulate the air. So sometimes they do write vague legislation. Sometimes they do write vague laws. And uh, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say they wrote this vague and they're gonna allow the agency to determine what is in the law and what needs to be in the law. So how do agencies define what a terrorist is? This is from the Communities Against Terrorism document, FBI and Bureau of Justice Assistance. People of gr groups who provide identification that is inconsistent or demand identity privacy. Don't want to give your social security number to Best Buy? Terrorist. <laughs> insists on paying with cash. Who insists on paying with cash in here? I like cash over credit, personally, okay? <laughs> Have missing hand or fingers, chemical burns, strange odors. You're supposed to call the FBI if somebody walks into your store with a strange odor on them. Well, they must get thousands of calls from Walmart every day. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, wow, that was tough. Um, <laughs> Make racist or extreme religious statements coupled with comments that are violent or appear to condone violence. Now, what's the problem with appearance? It's based on the opinion of others. It's based on the opinion of others. It does not matter what you are doing. So if I say I'm going to throw this at the audience, then most of you don't believe I'm actually going to do that. He'd probably kick me out. I'm sure there's several people here who would beat me up. Um, <laughs> I'm obviously not going to do that. However, it appears to someone walking by there who doesn't know my intent, it might appear I'm condoning violence. It doesn't matter what your intent is. Should I smile for the camera? <laughs> <laughs> Make suspicious comments regarding anti-US, radical theology, and vague or cryptic warnings that suggest or appear to endorse the use of violence in support of a cause. This is my favorite. Anti-U.S. comment. What's an anti-U.S. comment? No brain. No brain? Okay, I hate America. What else? What's like examples of anti-U.S. comments? The government takes too much tax. Okay, what else? Government sucks. <laughs> okay, what else? Need a new president. It's arbitrary. Need a new president. You have all kinds of anti-U.S. comments. You know, I was speaking in front of a little bit more liberal group at one point, and the first answer was also, we hate Obama, or Obama sucks. But the uh, general consensus is, it doesn't matter. What, it depends on what group you are. In fact, the closest thing I ever heard to an anti-US comment was, the United States is the wrong shape. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give you that. But it depends on who you're talking to, what an anti-US comment is. What's a radical theology? Is Christianity, Buddhism, Taoism, Islam? What's a radical theology? It depends on who you're talking to. What's the problem with a vague or cryptic warning? <laughs> it's vague or cryptic. You're not supposed to get it. Hey, I'm going to pop the pin off my beer bottle. Oh, that means I'm throwing a grenade. All right, what's next? This is from a document called the START Report. It's the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism, Response to Terrorism. This is committed, commissioned by the Department of Homeland Security. This is page 10 of the report. This is hotspots of U.S. terrorism. Who are the next terrorists in this country, according to the Department of Homeland Security? Groups or individuals who are nationalistic, 
as opposed to universal international orientation, anti-global, suspicious of centralized federal authority, reverent of individual liberty, and believe in conspiracy theories that involve grave threat to national sovereignty and or personal liberty. That sounds like our founding fathers, doesn't it? Wow. Single issue, groups or individuals, panda, that obsessively panda, focus on very specific panda, or narrowly defined panda, causes. In case you haven't guessed, my organization is considered a terrorist group by the United States federal government because we focus on the NDAA and on freeing America from tyranny. Here's another piece. Warning signs for police. People likely to commit violence speak against the government. Wow. You know, in Russia, in Penal Code 38, there's a law that says if you speak against the Communist Party, you will be exiled, jailed, for you and your family. And if you don't report somebody who speaks against the Communist Party, you face exile and imprisonment for you and your family. So when America says people who speak against the government are the next terrorists, who are they talking about? Us. They blame the government for their perceived problems. So if you blame the government for anything, now you're considered a possible terrorist. Remember, the government's not at fault for any of your issues. They, they are the benevolent dictator. They're fine. Unusual or extreme actions that catch the attention of others. See who that was? I, I'm young, I can still do jumping jacks. <laughs> Active online to show extreme views, slash connect with others. Slash means or. Anyone ever sent an email? Five people. Anyone ever sent an email? Okay, alright. Then, and just in case you did it, just in case you didn't raise your hand, there's a military document that says if you are not active online, your soldiers, your fellow soldiers should report you because you're a possible terrorist. So they're covering all the bases. <laughs> the Fire Department of New York. I did not say Police Department. The Fire Department of New York was ordered to report the license plate number of any car that had a map on the front seat. Because apparently terrorists don't use GPS. A map on the front seat. Now, just before we move on, let's take some guesses as to who created this list. Toss out some agencies, toss out some ideas. Who created this list? If it was that easy, I wouldn't ask. <laughs> who, who created this list? Nope. Obama. Nope. No, good guess. This is Obama. No, bad, no. Nope. A university. All the way in the back. No, not quite. I'm afraid to say they'll think I'm a terrorist. <laughs> 2,000 American police chiefs. 2,000 American police chiefs were brought to the White House for an anti-terrorism conference to come up with a document specifically defining what police officers should look for in a terrorist, and that is what they came up with. Wow. This is from a document that, from a place many of you might recognize. Who are all veterans in here? Any veterans? Okay, excellent. Combating Terrorism Center at West Point. Challenging from the sidelines, understanding America's violent far right. Violence derived from the modern anti-federalist movement. This is a term used in this document several times. Anti-federalist, this is interesting. So anti-federalist isn't a word you hear often. Anti-federalist. It's not like there's an anti-federalist book club next week. It's not like there's an anti-federalist coffee party tomorrow. You don't hear this word used often. What does it refer to? It refers to the people who made sure there was a Bill of Rights in your Constitution. So when they say the anti-federalists are the next terrorists, I don't need any more proof that they're talking about the Founding Fathers. Anyone recognize these two young men? <laughs> Anyone else? Anyone? All right. Top, Cameron D'Ambrosio, Methuen, Massachusetts. The bottom is Justin Carter, Austin, Texas. Cameron D'Ambrosio rapped about the Boston bombing shortly after it happened. Do I think that's a stupid idea? Does it deserve how many years in prison? 20 years in prison for online terrorist rap. Now, he was acquitted, but how did they get away with, they dragged him out of his house without a warrant, they called him a terrorist, 
And they almost sent him to prison for 20 years. How did they get away with it? Because they called him a terrorist. Justin Carter, Austin, Texas. Oh, no. Anyone know what... I, thankfully, there's young people in this room. Am I the only person in this room who knows what League of Legends is? All right, awesome. Oh, yes. Okay. Fellow nerds in the house. Uh, <laughs> After a heated League of Legends match in February, 18-year-old Justin Carter was on Facebook later, and they had a, some, one of the players called him insane. He responded with, oh yeah, I'm real insane. I'm going to go shoot up a school full of kids and eat their still beating hearts. Now, I'm a Yankee. We call this sarcasm. However, the, uh, a Canadian woman did not think so. She called the Austin Police Department. The Austin Police Department showed up at his house. Charge him, they charge him with terrorism. They throw him in jail. And uh, they set a $50,000 bail on getting him out. Now, he hasn't been gone to trial yet. This is pre-sentencing. $50,000 bail. To give you an idea, in uh, Nevada, you get $2,500 bail for a DUI. So a Facebook comment is at least, I can't do math, at least 20 times-ish more important than a DUI to the Austin Police Department. He was beaten up while in prison. And uh, he got out, anonymous donor gave him $50,000 bail, his story went international, and the judge refuses to stop prosecuting. What happens when we create a category called terrorists that have no rights? Lexington, Kentucky. Yeah, anybody know what a Drano and aluminum foil bomb is? Don't raise your hand sheepishly, you know, come on. <laughs> Okay, the Dram aluminum foil bomb is not really a bomb in the sense that it actually hurts anyone. It is essentially, you put aluminum foil in the cap of a two liter bottle, and you put Drano in the bottom. When the cap falls over, the aluminum foil touches the Drano, it goes bang, and that's about it. Well, some young boys, 13 to 15 year olds, year olds in Lexington, Kentucky, they went to some in the neighbor's house, their door opens out, and obviously the neighbor opens the door, the thing falls over, it goes bang, it scares the daylights out of them. They call the police. They weren't too happy. The police are charging them with operating a weapon of mass destruction. A weapon of mass destruction. Know what it says. Whether it be full-on bombs or just overpressure devices and soda bottles, lawmakers got very serious with the way they wrote laws. This is going to be taken very seriously. Lexington Police Spokeswoman Sherelle Roberts. What are they facing? A jail sentence of five to ten years. There were no reported injuries from the explosion. This is what happens. And America was okay with it at the time. America said it's Guantanamo Bay, it doesn't matter. America said they're not white, it doesn't matter. America said they're from the Middle East, they look like terrorists, they feel like terrorists, they're obviously terrorists. And we said that, we, that the government can create a category of people who do not have rights. In 1942, they called them saboteurs. They detained 120,000 Japanese Americans without charge or trial. They called the Irish Catholics terrorists. And now we created a category called terrorists of people that we're okay with not having rights. Well, what does the government have to do to make that category apply to you? All they do is redefine it, and now it applies to you, and now it applies to people my age. I can give you example after example after example. Hamilton, Ohio, two young girls joking back and forth on Facebook. One girl says, oh, I hate this school so much. The second girl says, oh yeah, I, I do too. And the third girl says, oh yeah, we should go uh, shoot at the school. And the girl said, oh yeah, I'll, I'll be your buddy, LOL, LOL. Well, somebody called the Hamilton Police Department, the girl's being charged with terrorism. Now, just to give you an idea, if I walk up to you and I go, I'm gonna mug you, <laughs> LOL, LOL, LOL. I'm probably not going to mug you. Yet, because we've created the category that gave the government ultimate power over anything someone does to throw them in jail without trial, and we were okay with Guantanamo Bay, then they redefine the category to include anyone they consider a threat. And that's the danger of not everyone having unalienable rights. You said earlier in the sermon that unalienable rights come from God, not the government. Well, that means what? That means it doesn't matter if you're a citizen or not. Because you can't have American citizens without an American government. And if the government's removed, are your rights removed? No. 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 Then rights apply to persons and we should start treating them that way or we create this fiasco. Just as a quick poll, does anybody fit into any of those categories I just mentioned? Anyone? Yeah. Okay, so the terrorists get together. Just wanted to make sure we're clear. Uh, if you fall under one of those categories, indefinite military detention is your punishment. 
In general, it says provided in paragraph 4, the armed forces of the United States shall hold a person described in paragraph 2, which we just read, the belligerent act, etc., who is captured in the course of hostilities authorized by the AUMF in military custody pending disposition under the laws of war. Notice it does not say the police. It does not say your local sheriff. It says the armed forces of the United States shall hold you in military custody. This is what we make fun of third world countries for. You have the military bursting in your door if you are critical of the government. Well, now we're doing it in our country. Do we really want to give the president that kind of power? No. Do we really want to give the president that kind of power? No. Absolutely not. Does the NDAA undermine your constitutional rights? Article 1, second, this is just a short list. It violates over 14 provisions of the Constitution, making it the most dangerous law ever passed by our government. Article 1, section 9, suspension clause. That you can't suspend habeas corpus unless in time where the public is in danger, during times of rebellion or invasion, where the public safety is in danger. They're not suspending habeas corpus, they're just ignoring it. Article 3, Section 2, grand jury indictment. If you do not get a trial, you will not get a grand jury. Article 3, Section 3, treason. This is interesting. Treason shall only exist in levying war against them or in bringing aid and comfort to their enemies. Now, that is defined as making war on someone, basically. So when Congress declares America a battlefield and you the enemy, how much more proof do I need they declare war on you? That's a treasonable offense. And secondly, there is only one crime ever defined in the Constitution, and that is treason. And you set the highest bar of any crime, which is either you have to confess in an open court to your action, or two people have to testify against you for the exact same overt act in an open court decided on by a jury. Well, when we killed 16-year-old Abdurrahman al-Awlaki in Yemen, born in Colorado, an American citizen, we didn't give him a trial, we called him a traitor. When we killed his father, Anwar al-Awlaki, we said, you sent emails back and forth between you and Major Nadal Hassan. He worked as an FBI informant until he saw the FBI violating Muslims' rights and he moved to Yemen. Then what did we do? We assassinated him. No charge, no trial, but what did they do? They called him a traitor. And then we assumed he didn't have rights. They did that to two other American citizens. There's four now. They just announced they're going to go kill another one. He's in Pakistan. We don't know anything much about him besides he's an American citizen in Pakistan. And the Obama administration announced on Yahoo News that they intend to take him out with a drone strike. Treason requires a jury trial. That's violated by the NDAA. First Amendment, free speech. Second Amendment, right to bear arms. Fourth, fifth, sixth, eighteenth, fourteenth. Tenth, I could go down the list. There's so many amendments violated in Oklahoma. Between the Oklahoma Constitution and the U.S. Constitution, the NDA violates 24 provisions. I guarantee you the Pennsylvania Bill of Rights, it violates several of those as well. And yet, that's not the most dangerous part of this law. The most dangerous part of the NDA is hidden in the requirement to detain. Let's look back at that. The armed forces shall hold someone captured in the war on terror in military custody pending disposition under the law of war. It does not say the Constitution. It says the law of war. When you apply the law of war to a territory, it is considered a battlefield. Give you a little history on the laws of war. Geneva Conventions are where this, they came up with the laws of war. This is war for countries making essentially war with each other. This is war, rules for international war. And uh, they created two categories of people. One, non-combatants. Two, combatants. If you were a combatant, you had a gun, you were under a flag, you were under a command structure. If you were a non-combatant, you didn't have those three. Very simple. Civilian, non-civilian, and corpsmen were considered, or medical officers were considered non-combatants. The rules were, you cannot torture, and you cannot execute. Non and you cannot execute either category. You must actually either capture them on a the battlefield or kill them in combat. That is, that is how that has to work. And they have what we know as prisoner of war status, POWs. Now, POWs are protected from torture, protected from all kinds of human rights abuses by the law when they're in military prison. Well, the Bush administration didn't like that so much after 9-11. And uh, the alleged 9-11 terrorists were put under a new category that they created out of thin air called unlawful enemy combatants. This category has all the punishments and all the penalties of the previous two categories, but none of the protections. 
we tortured those hijackers in Guantanamo Bay. And then, in 2009, Congress was advised by the Council on Foreign Relations that maybe you should change the definition of this from unlawful enemy combatant to unprivileged enemy belligerent. Because we want to go after people who aren't actually pointing guns at us. And they did. That was the category used to execute all four American citizens. Unprivileged enemy belligerent. Which, number one, implies your right to life is a privilege. And number two, belligerent. There's that term again. Now, where did we just hear the term belligerent? It was in the Belligerent Act portion of the NDAA. Why? Because a law created to torture and used to execute now applies to every single person on United States soil and every American citizen anywhere in the world. That's why the term Belligerent Act is in the NDAA. You are considered a spy, and America is considered a battlefield. A spy has no rights if captured by the enemy. Absolutely none. Now, what historical precedent do we have for this? Two times. Number one, the entire law of war, or the idea that the military could take control of areas, was first applied in 1862. Abraham Lincoln, as many of you know, who knows Abraham Lincoln suspended habeas corpus? Anybody? Okay. What many of you do not know, because you have not read Proclamation 94, is that he not only suspended habeas corpus, but he said any person found disloyal to the northern government shall be placed under military jurisdiction. He detained 15,000 northerners and executed most of them. Later, the Supreme Court, ex parte Milligan, ex parte means he's dead. Later, the Supreme Court, ex parte Milligan, said the Constitution is a shield for both rulers and men in times of war and times of peace, and that any of its provisions could be suspended during the great exigencies of government as a doctrine leads directly to anarchy and or despotism. That's the Supreme Court. And then we ignored them. February 21st, 1942. FDR signs Executive Order 9066. Most people know what happened with this. Authorized the detention of over 110,000 Japanese Americans. And yet this order says nothing about imprisonment. It says nothing about detention. All it says is that the military shall have control over certain areas of the country. The law of war will be applied. Those are the last two times. Let's bring it closer to home. Big Bear Lake, California, last year. Anybody know the name Christopher Dorner? Okay, some of you remember it. Uh, jog your memory a little bit. He was an LAPD cop who was accused of murdering other LAPD cops, had a manifesto posted online, etc., etc., right? In Big Bear Lake, California, where they were chasing after Christopher Dorner, they were sure he was in this area, so they locked down the entire city. They searched house to house to house to house to house. Whether you wanted them in there or not, they searched your home. And uh, they didn't find him. Later, when they did find him, they had him trapped in a cabin. They knew he was there. They had him surrounded by officers. They could have tear gassed the cabin. They could have done anything they wanted. What did they do? They set it on fire and burned him alive. This is what happens when the military takes control over certain areas of the country. Even closer, Watertown, Massachusetts, last year. Who saw the police response to the Boston Marathon bombing? Anybody? Okay. In Boston, the police locked that area down. In Watertown, the military took control. And in Watertown, you can see videos online of people being dragged out of their home at gunpoint. You can see videos of them being searched. You can see an entire city locked down by snipers and military personnel everywhere. They locked it down under martial law and they didn't find him, even though he was there because a guy came out afterward and said, there's blood on my boat, maybe you guys should come check the boat. And I was listening to a news broadcast from after they, they fired 117 bullets at an unarmed teenager suspected of the Boston bombing who was sitting in that boat. And uh, I was listening to the news broadcast and four, Channel 4 News. There is the reporter out in the field, there's a broadcaster uh, talking to the reporter, there's a lull in the action. So he asked the reporter, you live in Watertown, they came to your house, right? Well, yeah, they came to my house. Well, what happened? Well, yeah, they came in, they pointed guns at my kids, they looked around, then searched, and looked through the fridge, and looked through all the stuff, and then and they walked out, I had my kids thank them for their service on the way out. And I thought, they just pointed guns at your children. I've been on the receiving end of a 9mm. Those are scary. Those, I, I understand PTSD, I was di basically diagnosed with it, after facing that. I'm, Hollywood does it right. When the gun fires in Hollywood, it looks exactly like that in real life. Those children are going to be traumatized forever 
facing that gun at that, at that age, three, five, six years old. And he thanks them for their service on the way out. That's what happens when the military locks down an area. The military is not meant for that. In fact, we have something called the Posse Comitatus Act. Anyone familiar with that? Posse Comitatus. Okay. The Posse Comitatus Act basically says, the military shall not be used for law enforcement in this country. Why? Because when the military was using law enforcement in this country, then the Reconstruction period after the Civil War, and they enforced the Jim Crow laws. They prevented blacks from voting. They prevented blacks from going to the right, the right fountain. They enforced racism in the South when we had the military enforcing domestic law. So we've had that as precedent for years, and the NDAA just kind of throws it out the window. Now, the military can go wherever they want, do whatever they want, lock down whoever they want. Let's go back to the law. Section 1021C1. Disposition of the law of war. Notice this says may include following. It means we could include it, we might not. It's completely up to us. Detention of the law of war without trial until the end of hostilities authorized by the war on terror. Whenever your Congress passes a law saying without trial, you should be extremely concerned. Trial under Chapter 47A of Title 10 USC. This is a military trial. When American citizens not signed up for the military have been brought in front of military trial, most of them have been detained or executed. Transfer for trial by an alternative court or competent tribunal having lawful jurisdiction. Now, the Constitution says you will be tried in the state and district in which you committed the crime. This says if another court wants you, hey, they can have you. We think you'll be better prosecuted in New York. We caught you in California. We'll send you to New York to prosecute you. Transfer to the custody or control of the person's country of origin any other foreign country what? or any other foreign entity. I have a friend who's been interrogated by the Chinese government when she didn't know the language. I would obviously don't want to be detained. But if I were, I would rather be detained by the United States military than the Chinese or the Pakistani or the Iranian military because at least here I know the language. Yet they can take you wherever they want, however they want, whenever they want. So, I always point fun at a lot of alternative media for talking about the problem but never talking about the solution. So, we've come up with a solution called the Take Back Campaign. This campaign we launched back in 2013. These cities and counties have all banned the NDAA and the laws of war from their jurisdiction. The first city where we did this was Albany, New York, the capital of New York. This was in October of 2000, September, October 2013. People looked at us and went, you're going to take on the capital of New York. You've been around for a year and a half. You haven't won anything. And you're going to take on the capital of New York? And I told the team, I said, look, if we don't win here, we lost the state level. We introduced 18 pieces of legislation. Every one of them failed. We lost the state level. I told the team, if we do not win here, nobody's going to take us seriously. Put all our chips on the board. We launched a new website, Take Back Albany. We've got 15 organizations on the ground, over 3,000 flyers distributed. On the day of the vote, the projected vote was 7 to 6. That's 13 people, because I can't do math now. Which means two people, because it's a 15-person council, hadn't decided yet, and they would go with the winners. So it would be 9 to 6. That was against us. When we showed up to city council that day, we had 100 people there, and we had a live band. Now, that was fun. We had a live band, 100 people there. The city council atrium was packed. The city council was packed. There were people standing outside. And when the guy who uh, was leading the fight up there, Jesse Calhoun, when he got up to the podium, he said, everyone who's here in the favor of the resolution, please stand up. The entire building stood up. That vote, 11 to 0. <laughs> they were afraid to vote against us. Over and over and over again, we've done this. So how does it work? Number one, pass the Restoring Constitutional Governance Resolution. Now, I gave the resolution to your pastor and your bishop. They have a copy of that. They should be making some more copies, I'm sure, for everyone else. This resolution bans the NDA and the laws of war legally from being used in a city or county. However, we also know that if paper protected us, the Constitution wouldn't be violated right now. So we don't want to rely on a piece of paper to protect us. It just gives you